Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So what's going on in the Ukraine and Russian border? 100,000 troops, 100,000 Russian troops supposedly masked at the Ukrainian border. And uh, um, a friend of mine, someone who I've interviewed before on immigration uh, uh, issues, uh, Andy Semichuk, uh, has written three really interesting articles about what's going on. Uh, uh, I guess, Andy, you're a uh, Ukrainian descent. Uh, you've recently come back from a visit to the Ukraine. You're uh, very politically involved and, uh, and involved in, in, um, in, in, in Toastmasters and speaking, and uh, you want to make some points about what's going on. So I wanted everyone to uh, reach out to Andy to find out what, uh, you know, someone who's sort of at the front lines, uh, not the front lines necessarily of, of uh, Ukraine, but certainly on international political issues and, uh, and, and what's going on uh, to talk to us tonight. So Andy, you, you were in the Ukraine recently. Tell me a little bit about what, uh, what you think is happening and what is the point that you're making in your articles. Okay, well, basically we're on the verge of a war, a larger war. Uh, Russia has been invading Ukraine already for seven years. They took over Crimea and the Donbass and they're now preparing to invade uh, Ukraine, a larger part of Ukraine, shall we say, basically take over Ukraine. And in uh, Putin's view, restore Ukraine as part of uh, a greater Russian civilization. That's what's happening uh, on the Ukrainian level. But on the international level, what's going on is there's a, a, a rupture of the international rules-based uh, order that was established um, uh, at Helsinki uh, regarding Europe. And to put it in context, two world wars were fought essentially, uh, for the most part, over boundaries in Europe. And uh, after this, you know, 20 million died in the first, 50 million in the second. And after that, the European community and the world in general leaders drew out of, uh, out of those wars the following conclusion. They need to settle boundaries and agree that boundaries should not be changed unless in agreement, but certainly not through aggression. And the final act of the Helsinki Accord, that was the purpose of that agreement, uh, sort of ironically at the behest of the former Soviet Union to establish its security for the boundaries that it had at the time. Uh, but all the countries in Europe signed, and uh, this, uh, starting with Crimea and onward, was the first since uh, the end of World War II, the first instance where the boundaries were changed by aggression. So we have a kind of a, a threat to the world order. And as Canadians, we might also consider that Russia borders on Canada up in the far north, and there are implications for us as Canadians. And also there are implications in the uh, larger scheme of things for countries like uh, Taiwan, for example. In my view, it's almost predictable that if Putin invades Ukraine again now, that uh, China will invade Taiwan to, uh, because it'll be kind of an excuse and also a justification for why some uh, country like Taiwan, again, a uh, sort of a, a autocratically ruled country uh, who can exert its power to uh, invade, um, you know, Taiwan, which it's wanted to incorporate into China for long periods of time now. So what do you think the answer is? If, uh, if you are suggesting that you think we're about to have war and there's 100,000 Russian troops amassed at the Ukrainian-Russian border, what do you think we should do? Should NATO counterattack? Well, uh, I don't think, uh, realistically speaking, that NATO uh, will get into the war. I don't think we're ready as Canadians, nor are the Americans ready to send their troops into Ukraine to protect Ukraine. Um, and look, I'm not God. I don't have all the pieces together, but the best I can make out of this is um, sending arms uh, and providing whatever assistance can be provided to Ukraine short of uh, 
sending troops uh, is what we should do. And we should be imposing sanctions now, now because um, Russia has got troops in Ukraine. Like they've already invaded Ukraine. They've already violated the agreements that we're talking about. In fact, an interesting thing that's happened is recently the foreign affairs uh, ministry of Ukraine published in English on its website, 12 agreements, you know, the UN charter, the Budapest uh, Accords and others, uh, Helsinki and so on, 12 agreements that Russia has uh, broken uh, in invading Ukraine. Um, meaning uh, not much we can, um, there's not much uh, sense in trying to trust assurances from Russia that uh, things will be okay. Uh, we have to deal with them um, in the sense. This is very similar, I might say, to what was going on in, in, uh, in Europe uh, prior to World War II breaking out. I mean, Hitler had invaded Czechos uh, Austria, then Czechoslovakia, and then he invades Poland. And it's only at Poland that the Western allies woke up and realized, okay, ho, ho, we're in a war here. And we got a similar, do I want war? No, I don't want war. I don't, you know, I don't want people dying. Uh, you know, I don't, <clears throat> I don't want needlessly to alarm people and uh, sort of uh, uh, wake them up from a stupor or whatever it is that we're in. Uh, but this is really, really serious. The menace is real. And I myself might add, did not believe that Putin would actually invade. I thought this was all saber rattling until recently. But the breakdown of the talks between the United States and Russia last week, this week that just passed, and a cyber attack that has leveled the government of Ukraine, uh, many departments of the government of Ukraine, some cyber attack that they're looking into who did it, uh, I wonder who would have done that and had the capability of doing that. My sense is, yes, it's Russia. And this is the, um, the beginning. And I'll just add this one final comment. Putin laid down a one-week ultimatum. Either you sign and agree that NATO should never in, uh, enter into Ukraine and that you know we should withdraw basically from forward positions that NATO has in Europe and so on, uh, or else, and, uh, you know, meaning he's ready to invade and or else is he's going to invade. Uh, the cyber attack that I just mentioned, which just came on yesterday, I believe, suggests to me that he's preparing for the invasion. And um, um, I would just say this, from everything I know and the and medical people that I know, uh, psychiatrists included, uh, they say he's a psychopath. And one characteristic of psychopaths is that they like to dupe their opponents. They like to fool or they get great pleasure out of taking advantage of opponents in a, in a period of weakness. And we're in a period of weakness as far as the United States is concerned, A, because of the Afghanistan collapse, and B, also another sort of ironic situation is January 22nd, which happens to be the day after the end of the ultimatum, is an anniversary of Ukraine's first declaration of independence after 300 years of, of uh, Soviet rule, well, 75 years of Soviet rule and 300 years of Russian domination of Ukraine back in 1917. It's a symbolic day for Ukrainians. January 22nd. So I don't know, maybe, maybe we will see something happen on January 22nd, or in, if not then, then in the weeks to follow. But I, I'm apprehensive about January 22nd. We're chatting tonight with uh, Andy Semichuk, uh, who is a uh, immigration lawyer here in Toronto of Ukrainian descent, recently uh, visited Ukraine. Uh, and he's penned recently three articles on what's going on between Ukraine and Russia. And uh, we're chatting about uh, his fears of what's going to happen and, uh, and what he thinks we should do. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Andy in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody.
Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're talking about Ukraine and Russia and the 100,000 troops, uh, Russian troops, that are amassed at the border with Ukraine with Andy Semichuk, who is a local immigration lawyer um, uh, of Ukrainian descent, very knowledgeable in international affairs, very knowledgeable about a lot of issues, uh, and uh, very articulate. Uh, he's recently penned three articles that uh, I read and uh, found quite interesting, and so I wanted to have him on the show talking about uh, the issue. Um, Andy, let me just sort of try to, you know, peel back the onion a little bit, particularly regards some of the uh, allegations or, or, or assessments that, uh, that Putin has made uh, and, and your analogy versus uh, World War II, um, Czechoslovakia, Austria, et cetera. So, you know, Putin invaded, took over Crimea. And, uh, and said that effectively Crimea was, was something that, uh, that was Russian territory that was given to the Ukraine when the Soviet Union was created. Um, and uh, I, I may not pronounce it right, but the Dobos uh, region, uh, uh, is that the correct? Uh, Donbass. Don, Don Donbass region, um, he said was, was effectively white Russian, um, primarily Russian speakers, primarily Russian people, um, and therefore better, more better thought as part of Russia rather than uh, uh, as part of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, and you also you know, said that uh, Russia dominated uh, Ukraine for what did you say, 75 years under the Soviet well, Union? The Soviet Union, 75 years. And 500 years. years previous to that uh, yeah. as really part of Russia. And um, you know, I visited uh, Kiev, uh, as I think we've chatted about before. And um, the Minsk, is it called the Minsk? Uh, Palace is where the czars used to uh, spend their winters, um, yeah. and uh, and so the the czars of Russia actually saw Kiev as, I guess, for some portion of the year, the capital city of uh, Russia, and that's where they built a beautiful palace that stands today, and tourists go visit. So, and you know, compared to, I guess. Hitler's arguments, part of Czechoslovakia and Austria, he thought were part of Germany and even Prussia, the part of, uh, of Poland he thought was part of Germany. So tell me a little bit about what, is there any justification to Putin's argument? Well, okay. Um, the only reason we would get into the argument of the Putin's argument about uh, what he calls Russian civilization and which he says includes Ukraine and Belarus uh, is that he's using a historic argument for uh, a rationale for why he has the right to invade and also indeed to maintain a, seg a security corridor or corridor around uh, today's Russia. Uh, so uh, he claims that Ukraine uh, or Kiev and Rus, uh, where Ukraine first started, was part of the, you know early Russia and Kiev to him is the spiritual center of Russian orthodoxy. But there's just to uh, just to comment on that. There's I just happen to have this book here, which is a new a book that just came out. It's called The History of Ukraine Rus, written by a guy named Mikhailo Hrushevsky. and it was published by. It's a second volume in English, published by the Canadian Institute. Uh, for Ukrainian studies here in Canada. It's about 500 pages long. And uh, for those who might be interested uh, to study the history uh, a little bit more closely, they might uh, dive into this book, which appears to be at this moment, the leading book on the subject in terms of the historical side of what's going on. And uh, I might also add that there's this book, which is by Timothy Snyder called The Road to unfreedom for those who don't have time to read a 500 page book, but would like to get a short version of the history. And I'll give you the shorter version right now, which is Kevin Rus, which was the origin of Ukraine, was around for, you know, 988, it became Christian. Volodymyr, the head of Kevin Rus, invited Christianity in from, um, uh, from what is today Istanbul, but was then Constantinople. At that time, Moscovy, which is the predecessor of what Russia is today, did, didn't exist. What there were up north were some Finnish tribes, basically wandering around, nothing. 
And not until 1250, that was in 988, by the way. And that cave in Rush was around, you know, like basically for, you know, 400 years up until 1250 when the Mongols invaded and Muscovy became tied up with the Mongols and eventually became a, a state that invaded Ukraine and others in the area. And they're claiming that, uh, you know, the cave in Rush was their ancestry. No, no, no. And these books establish why not. Uh, in terms of modern day, why this is significant, Putin is using this argument that, hey, this is our territory. You know, we, this is our country. We have the right to invade. But no, it, it, it wasn't their territory. It's not their territory now. And they got military soldiers on Ukraine's land, which in modern times should not be there because of the Helsinki Accord. That's a brief historical argument about that subject. Okay, so, you know, we, lots of us know the, the history of World War II and Austria and Crimea, um, uh, sorry, Austria and Czechoslovakia, Freudian slip there, um, and, uh, and the Munich Conference and Chamberlain appeasing Hitler and, and allowing him to take over Czechoslovakia. Was us not opposing the takeover of Crimea appeasement and a mistake on the, the likes uh, of uh, the Munich Accord? Yes, in the sense that uh, how do you deal with bullies? You have to be tough on bullies. You can't just let them you know, walk all over you. And that's where it started. The moment he invaded Crimea, he broke the... Uh, guarantees that were put down in Helsinki. But more important, the most important thing is this. And if you don't get anything else out of this interview, get this. In, in Budapest, uh, the R Russia, the United States, uh, the UK, France, and China, and Ukraine met and signed an agreement under which Ukraine surrendered its nuclear arsenal, which was the third largest nuclear arsenal following the, de uh, the demise of the Soviet Union in the world, 5,000 strategic and tactical nuclear weapons. Ukraine surrendered them to Russia in exchange for a guarantee from Russia and co-guarantee from the other countries that Russia would respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine and its sovereignty. And Russia turned around and instead invaded Ukraine, as uh, we've talked about, through Crimea. So um, it's historical, it's a historical precedent. This has never happened before. No nuclear war, no nuclear uh, country has ever surrendered its uh, nuclear arsenal to its uh, opponent only to end up being invaded by that opponent. And uh, that's why it's, it was so significant an event. Uh, unquestionably uh, significant. Again, and, and, I, and I don't want to, I don't support this point of view and I don't want to take this uh, um, analogy too far, but let's just go with it for a second. Um, you know, Hitler, a lot of Germans thought Austria was a natural part of Germany. And, uh, and there were a lot of Austrians that supported uh, the German takeover of Austria. I visited Ukraine. Um, and uh, I've done work in the Ukraine, as, as you and I have chatted about before. Um, there are a lot of people that don't speak Ukrainian, speak Russian. Um, when I was in Kiev, uh, it was almost as if there were two solitudes, the Ukrainian solitude and the Russian solitude. Uh, a lot of the banks that uh, I interacted with were, were Russian uh, banks. Um, it almost seemed like there were two political parties, two political divides, one that was from the west of Ukraine that was Ukrainian and pro-West, and one that was from Eastern Ukraine that was Russian and pro-Russia. Um, is there an argument that some people in Ukraine, maybe of Russian descent, maybe of Russian speaking, um, uh, are comparable to those Austrians that welcomed Germany into Austria prior to World War II? Yes, there are people like that in Ukraine. There's no doubt about it. But 90% of Ukrainians during a referendum pertaining to the independence of Ukraine, voted in favor of independence. And Putin has done Ukraine a great service. He's united both Ukrainian speakers and Russian speakers, by and large. 
uh, into one category, uh, pro-Ukrainian independence and sovereignty by invading Ukraine in, in Crimea and through the Donbass. So that's one positive side out of a negative war. Uh, and in any conflict, uh, any conflict anywhere in the world, Brian, there will all, you, you're a political animal, so you'll understand this. Any political change will always involve some who are for the change, others who are against the change. You'll never have 100% agreement about any, any, any political issue. And uh, it's a matter of majority and uh, what, how, how much of a majority and uh, you know, uh, the other factors that come into a political change that makes the difference. But in this case, the agreements, like 12 agreements signed by Russia pertaining to respecting borders are, were violated on that invasion in, in, um, in Crimea. And we're learning the same, I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know, you know, are we going to end up in a war like you and I, are we going to be, we could be, I mean, who knows? But uh, we're learning the same lesson again, which is when you're dealing with a tyrant or an autocrat, you have to draw the line and you have to be tough with a person like that. You can't let them, you know, he's munching away at the cookie jar. He took one bite, Crimea looked good, nobody really did anything. Now another bite, Donbass, he's into his third bite now. And you guys lately, are still sleeping. So lately he's been suggesting that there is um, actions against Russian speakers in uh, in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, I don't want to take the analogy too far, but the justification Hitler had to uh, attack Poland on September 3rd, uh, uh, 1939 uh, was uh, that uh, that uh, German-speaking people in Poland were being persecuted. Um, is there an analogy there? Okay, yeah. Okay, is there some uh, abuse of uh, Russians in Ukraine? Doubtful. They're a very strong majority. They're able to speak Russian. Uh, it's it's a you know it's not the dominant language, but it's a, a it's a important language in Ukraine. It it was the dominant language until. You know, recently, because all the airways, you know, all the media and so on were all in Russian. Uh, but I might raise another question with you, which is I think there's a, at least a half a million Ukrainians, if I'm not mistaken, in, in Russia, in, it, it may be just in Moscow, uh, but they have no rights. They, there's no Ukrainian churches, no Ukrainian schools, uh, no Ukrainian community centers, nothing. Nobody's saying anything about them. But uh, if, if there's some kind of concern about Russians uh, in, in Ukraine, why isn't there any concern about Ukrainians in Russia as a sort of a, a, another sort of allied issue? Uh, it's a pretext. Like, uh, he, I don't know. Are we that stupid that we're going to take, you know, we're going to, we've gone for that already. I mean, like, we didn't even buy Hitler's pretext. Are we going to buy this guy's pretext? Like, really? Okay, the and, other uh, argument that has been made, and I'd like you to address this, is this is like the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so what, uh, what Putin has said is he cannot allow Ukraine to join NATO, that uh, that would allow um, NATO forces and NATO armaments to be just too close to Russia, to Moscow, et cetera. And going back to the early 1960s, that was what effectively... Uh, the United States and Kennedy said that we cannot allow Russian missiles in uh, in Cuba. Um, and effectively, what the United States wanted was, even though Cuba was an independent, sovereign country, um, they wanted a veto over whether they could be Russian military establishments uh, in Cuba. What uh, people are saying now is we can't allow Russia to have a veto over whether Ukraine is part of uh, NATO or not. Is... Ukraine to Russia, like Cuba was to the United States. That's a that's a good argument. I mean, it's a, it's one that's popular, and from a power politics point of view, if you didn't look at all the details, it's true. I mean, it is a kind of an analogy, but here are some details that uh, make sense. You know, make mincemeat out of the argument. Number one is. Again, what I've mentioned, 5,000 nuclear missiles were surrendered to Russia on the guarantee that Russia would respect the sovereignty of Ukraine. They haven't. 
There was no such analogy in Cuba. Otherwise, there are some other things. Uh, since 2004, no Eastern country has joined NATO. There are no, uh, there's no buildup of military might, uh, NATO military might on the Russian border. Uh, they've not been uh, encircling Russia in some way. So where is this concern about security? Who has declared that they're interested in invading Russia? Who is, you know, is there any evidence of some sort of a, a security threat other than what is um, contended by uh, Putin uh, and other Russian leaders uh, pertaining to their security uh, on the borders of, of Russia? The contrary is true. Russia has made all the threats in Ukraine, in Georgia, Moldova, and so on. They're the ones that have been invading other countries. Um, so um, to, to argue, well, OK, let's uh, propose a, 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 a solution to this problem. Putin, you withdraw all your troops from Ukraine, including Crimea and Donbass, everything, and leave them alone forever and respect Ukrainian sovereignty like you've planned to and signed and agreed to respect for the last 12 agreements that you signed and since World War II. In exchange, let Ukraine join the European Union and let NATO agree to, uh, to offer a guarantee of sovereignty and independence for Ukraine in exchange for Russia also agreeing to guarantee the sovereignty and independence of Ukraine. That could be a deal that would work out. But Putin will never go for that because it's all a pretext. He doesn't want he doesn't want an agreement with the West about Ukraine. He wants to invade Ukraine and make it part of Russia because he's building the former Soviet empire again. He's a, a new uh, Tsar, a new Russian Tsar. We're chatting tonight with Andy Samachuk, who is a local Toronto-based immigration lawyer, uh, Ukrainian, uh, Canadian, and uh, very knowledgeable of what's going on in Ukraine, particularly in regards to Ukrainian-Russian issues. We're going to take a break and come back more with Andy in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Andy Semichuk. He is a local Toronto-based immigration lawyer, um, Ukrainian expert, and uh, and Andy, you're president of a, a local Eastern European organization. Tell us about that. Yeah, I'm president of the Center for Eastern European Democracy, which is a nonprofit, federally incorporated Canadian organization working in Toronto. Excellent. And what does that organization do? Uh, its its mission is to advocate liberal democracy in Eastern Europe to support leaders who are promoting uh, liberal democracy in Eastern Europe. Excellent. I didn't know that. How long has that organization been around? It's been around for about a year and a half now. And what are you doing with this current controversy? Uh, well, we've published uh, these articles that uh, you mentioned. Uh, we have an index that we've uh, uh, a page that uh, ranks countries according to how they stand on the various key issues like rule of law, uh, human rights, uh, freedom, democracy, etc. We've collected we have probably the world's one of the world's leading collection of uh, indic indices on countries and how they're doing on the subject of uh, of the main elements of democracy in in Eastern Europe uh, today. Well, congratulations and thank you for that involvement. Um, let me ask you another question. Some people think that uh, Putin is doing this just to shore up his support in Russia. It's sort of like a, a populism, nationalism, almost like a, a make America great again kind of, uh, of effort. Uh, the argument goes that uh, Putin's popularity is actually very low right now. The economy is uh, not doing well in Russia. And one of the ways that uh, you garner public support is through nationalism, through uh, a common enemy, through a common effort. And, and so he's just doing this to, to save his own hide. What do you think of that? There's merit to that argument. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, he seems his his numbers seem to improve when he's involved in a conflict outside of uh, this the uh, Russian orbit or in, inside the sort of security perimeter uh, of his country. 
So um, that could be a rationale for why he why he's undertaking, uh, you know, the steps that he's undertaking. Uh, look, a lot of this is, uh, uh, this conflict is in Putin's interest. It's not necessarily in Russia's interest. Uh, Russians uh, may find that there's, they have more at stake uh, and uh, better chances of uh, making peace with uh, Europe and uh, increasing their economic ties to Europe. And I might just draw an analogy. At the end of World War II, uh, the big challenge was uh, what to do with Germany. How, how do we contain German aggression and uh, turn that country into a, an ally as opposed to an enemy? And uh, what happened was the kernel of that thinking was the creation of the Euro European Union. And over time, uh, Germany and France and the UK became the big partners that uh, created a European Union. And today, G Germany is not a threat to any of its neighbors because the economics of the, of the Union are so strong and uh, worthwhile for Germany that there's no reason for Germany to be involved in aggression uh, against its powers, the other powers uh, in the area. A similar argument should be used for Russia. What Russia needs today is democracy. They need to get rid of Putin and his oligarchs. You know, the, what is it? Today, Russia is a gangster state. It's a, you know, gas station effectively. Uh, their one and only uh, resource is oil and gas. That's how they're making their money. Putin right now has something like 600, over $600 billion in his kitty, uh, which he can uh, use to sort of carry on, even if he's sanctioned from economically sanctioned. Uh, he's got, you know, a few years worth of uh, uh, money in his in his kitty that, that can carry the, the country along. Um, and he's got the luck that he's got the oil and gas that Europe needs. So there's a natural sort of uh, cohesion between Russia and, and Western Europe, like Germany and the other countries there. So... Uh, uh, but if you could turn that into a positive, as opposed to, you know, wh what should Eastern Europe be doing right now? It should be competing as a region with Western Europe, North America, South America, and so on. But not in missiles and not in uh, tanks and guns and, uh, you know, rockets, uh, bombs, etc. But in architecture and literature and, you know, uh, technology and so on. So the problem is, how do you turn it around? And I think the answer is, we've got to try over, over time to get Russia to convert into a democratic society and ultimately join the European community and, and work with Europe in that way. And that was sure certainly the hope when the USSR um, fell apart, when Gorbachev, uh, uh, you know, brought in, prost per, what was the word, perestroika? Perestroika, word? yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, an openness. Um, Glasnost, yeah. Glasnost, and uh, and Yeltsin uh, was uh, the president of Russia, but um, then Putin and the KGB or former KGB seemed to take over again. So, what hope is there for democracy in Russia today? There is some hope. Uh, for example, there are some uh, leading figures, uh, Russians, some in the West, uh, some in in, in Russia who advocate democracy, liberal style democracy. By liberal democracy, I mean like European style democracy, as opposed to like Korean, North Korean democracy, for example, because there are countries that say they're democratic, but uh, you know, like, you know, how can you believe that? Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, there's uh, Kasparov as a leading figure, for example, um, uh, you know, the, Navalny is a, a sort of, democratic in orientation, but he's an imperialist in the sense that Russian democracy for him ends at the borders. So he does not advocate returning Crimea to Russia. He's an advocate of keeping Crimea as sort of along the line of what Churchill was, which was democracy in Great Britain, but not in the colonies. Uh, so India, for example, uh, ended up going through a almost a gen well actually a genocide uh, you know uh, related to um, Churchill's policies um, so so we got that kind of a feature going on among some of the uh, the uh, uh, opponents in Russia 
Give us a sense of uh, the democracy or the state of democracy in Ukraine today, if you could. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us were really excited about the Orange Revolution, um, and that seems to have petered out. And uh, then we got a lot of press, uh, when was it, a year or two ago, when a comic uh, was elected, uh, was it president of uh, Ukraine. Tell us, uh, give us a sort of a, an overview of the state of democracy of politics in Ukraine today. Well... <laughs> Good question. Um, it could be better. It's not the greatest, but it's not the worst either. One of the key features of democracy is succession planning, that a state can uh, change leadership without war, basically, or civil war. And luckily for Ukraine, it has had a pattern of changing leaders uh, you mentioned uh, Zelensky, for example, as the most recent leader. Uh, there is some uh, troubling um, aspects. There are some troubling aspects to Ukraine. For example, corruption is still endemic. But uh, the key to analyzing Ukraine and indeed other countries in Eastern Europe is to look at them in a regional or perhaps even an international uh, lens. So, for example, if we want to talk about corruption in Ukraine, you have to bear in mind that there's corruption all around Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, all these countries, Turkey and all that. It's hard to be a Democrat when everybody around you is, a, you know, an autocrat. A try and be a Democrat in the, you know, in the Nazi party. Mission almost impossible. Try to be a Democrat in a communist party. Also, mission almost impossible. Try to be a de democracy in a in a sea of allies or countries around you that are all autocratic or anti-democratic. Very difficult. So on any one of these uh, measuring sticks, let's talk about corruption. Let's look at corruption in Russia. Let's look at corruption in Belarus. Let's look at corruption in Poland or wherever else and Ukraine and compare them. And you'll see, or I think we will see, that... Uh, it's like Brian, uh, Brian Mulroney used to say, if you compare me against the ideal, I don't look so very good. But if you compare me relative to other leaders, political leaders, I'm not bad. And I think the same is true for Ukraine. I mean, they're not great, but um, you know, they're doing their part. They're trying to do their part. They're, sometimes they're falling. Like for example, right now, Zelensky's got a case out against Poroshenko, the former Prime uh, President of Ukraine. It's uh, I, I read a legal opinion about it. It's bogus, man. It's bogus. But the, you know they're trying to pin down Poroshenko. You know, it's, now he he may have been involved in some corruption. I'm not an expert on him, but uh, the case that they got running against him, that's not going to go anywhere. Although they've got him pinned down, and you know the uh, that's an example. You know that's an example where it's out of kilter. So my, it's got uh, a ways to go, but my ex father in law um, of Ukrainian descent uh, told me that uh, Russians and Ukrainians could never work together uh, well uh, because of the historical uh, uh, genocide that he described that took place uh, in Ukraine at Stalin's hands. Uh, uh, I think it was called the Holodomor. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, in 1932-1933, an artificial famine was imposed on Ukraine, on the country of Ukraine, the territory, the Republic of Ukraine, in which 4 million Ukrainians died. And if you counted the regions around Ukraine that were Ukrainian-dominated, another 1 million at least died. So altogether, according to demographers, the, the people who are best able to measure the amounts and so on, as of today's standards, it looks like about 5 million Ukrainians died in an artificial famine, as mentioned by you, uh, caused by Stalin, to break the, the back of the Ukrainian resistance to the Soviet sort of uh, policies that uh, were intended to uh, sort of destroy the national basis of, uh, of existence in Ukraine, the Ukrainian sort of spirit and, and character. But then for 75 years after World War II, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. It was indeed. And uh, so that was 32, 33. And then in 40, you know, then we went into World War, you know, in 19, 1933 was a unbelievably bad year for the world. 
Number one, Hitler came to power in Germany. Number two, not many people knew, but you mentioned the whole of the war took place. And what's number three, another terrible event that took place in 1933, which slipped my mind at the moment. But anyway, there are three main events that took place in 1933 that set the world back. Um, and uh, from 33 till 39, uh, there was a build up to World War II, basically. So, um, you know, uh, with World War II, then, uh, you know, with the invasion, Germany invaded Poland in September of 1939, 1st of September, 1939. What we forget about is that invasion was something that was agreed to in August of 1939 between Stalin and Hitler. And the agreement was, you're gonna take Western Ukraine, um, Western Poland, sorry. And uh, that is to say, Hitler's gonna take Western Poland and Stalin's gonna take Eastern Poland, which included Western Ukrainian territories. And that Stalin would also get the Baltic states involved. You know, they, he would get the, so that was a secret pact that led to World War II. What I'm saying is that unlike the traditional view, the actual factual view is that World War II was started by Hitler and Stalin in agreeing to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in August 1939. But Hitler and Germany was punished for its uh, role in World War II. The Soviet Union was never brought to account really for its role in uh, starting up World War II. And we've kind of lived with the Soviet Union until it fell apart in 1991. And now we're living with Russia, sort of the descendant thereafter. We're chatting tonight with Andy Semichuk. Uh, he is president of the Eastern European, what, what's the organization called, sir? Center for Eastern European Democracy. C. The Center for Eastern European Democracy. Uh, he's an immigration lawyer. Uh, he's an expert on Ukraine. He's of Ukrainian descent, a Ukrainian Canadian, and uh, he's recently penned three articles on uh, the Russian-Ukrainian uh, issue. Uh, if people want to uh, find out more about the, uh, the Center for Eastern Ukrainian uh, uh, Diplomacy, um, a democracy uh, and or get your articles. How do they do that, sir? Okay, uh, check out the website. It's seed, C-E-E-D web, one word, seedweb.ca. There's uh, a website which gives you everything you need to know. Awesome. We're going to take a break and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. I'm going to ask Andy, what Canada, what NATO should do, needs to do, must do in this situation if uh, if we're not going to be appeasement like Chamberlain was at Munich. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm chatting tonight about Ukraine and Russia. 100,000 Russian troops are amassed at the Ukrainian border. It really does sound eerily similar to what happened in 1939 um, uh, and before uh, with uh, appeasement at uh, Munich uh, where Czechoslovakia, Austria were effectively given over to, uh, to Hitler and the German uh, Nazi, not German uh, Nazi uh, uh, party. Um, Cause I don't think it was Germany. It was really the Nazi party. And I think this is not really Russia. It's Putin and, uh, and his party um, because for some reason, the Nazi party took over Germany and, and Putin and his party are taking over Russia and it's not really Russians, it's, it's the party. Um, Andy, are, is Canada, the United States, NATO, ready to go to war to save Ukraine? Should we, must we? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, our future is at stake here. Uh, among other things, because we border on Russia, and uh, right now the, the battle is over on the western side of, uh, of Europe uh, for Russia, the western side of Russia. But, uh, you know, who knows in terms of what's next? I think what's going to happen is this. If Putin invades Russia, I think China will almost instantly invade Taiwan. 
And what will likely happen is the attention of the world will be taken away from Ukraine and over to Taiwan and what's happening in the East. But it'll be troubling times uh, worldwide for us as Canadians and Americans, as well as Europeans. And uh, I don't know, you know what to unravel of all this, but I will say this, um, it's time for sanctions now, not when po Putin invades Ukraine. Putin has already invaded Ukraine. It's time for uh, Russia to be um, with, you know, they have this swift uh, currency trading system. Uh, it's time for them to be unplugged from that system now. It's time for sanctions to be imposed on Putin and his colleagues, the guys in the Kremlin, the oligarchs, the gangsters that are running the show over there. Um, so, Canada could do a lot in terms of advocating for those kind of sanctions now. Uh, and also to increase the stakes if Putin invades, whatever way we can, uh, we have to be, like I'm not inviting us to do this because we want to expose ourselves uh, to the war in, in Ukraine and whatever's going on there. It's we're already exposed to the war that's going on over there. We just don't, uh, we don't perceive the threat that that's uh, posing to our lives here. And uh, we just need to be more conscious of what's going on over there. I like the fact that Canada's foreign ministers over there right now are planning to go over if she's not there just yet. Um, and, and trying to you know settle things in some way or get things uh, sorted out as best we can uh, as a Canadian leader. So those are some of the thoughts on that subject. One of the things that the United States tried to do, uh, NATO tried to do, was to get uh, Europe deal with European issues and force Germany and, uh, and France and, and other countries to, to try to deal with some of the Ukrainian uh, um, Russian issues in regards to uh, um, Crimea, et cetera, Crimea, et cetera. But they were reluctant to because they were dependent on Russian natural gas to heat themselves during uh, the wintertime. Is that a complication? Is it ever? I mean, they're vulnerable. Uh, Western Europe is very vulnerable because they have to rely on Russian gas. And we haven't taken the steps necessary to somehow weed us off that de dependence to the degree we should have, I guess, back. But be that as it may, uh, we have to do what we can. And uh, uh, isolation for us is not the policy. It's not sort of, okay, you that's your problem. It's not your problem, it's our problem. That's the reason why an isolationist policy is not gonna work for us. Um, this is a worldwide problem. It's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's something that all of us have to uh, work, work together on. Andy, you said January 22nd is an important date. Yeah. If we wake up January 22nd and Russian tanks are going across the border of Ukraine, should we declare war? Uh, Ukraine, uh, okay, Ukraine's at war. We are in a cold war, and we have been for many uh, years. We can acknowledge that. Are we prepared to shoot missiles at, at uh, Moscow because they're invading Ukraine? I don't know if we're uh, prepared to do that unless they shoot missiles at us. Uh, but we do need to um, uh, ratchet up the sanctions for sure and provide whatever military aid is needed in order for Ukraine. We will, our, our sort of role is going to be, we will fight this war to the last Ukrainian soldier standing is unfortunately the ironic role that we're going to be playing now if that war breaks out at the moment. But we can certainly help in fighting that war in terms of providing military um, equipment, uh, economic aid, and uh, uh, you know, rallying the world opinion against uh, what's going on there. So I'll uh, leave you with my uh, thoughts, uh, uneducated uh, um, as they are uh, compared to uh, your incredible knowledge, sir. But I do think uh, there is a lot of analogy to uh, September of uh, 1939 here. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, 
there's some lessons learned. I think that appeasement in Munich and, uh, in Austria and Czechoslovakia was a mistake. And I think we've repeated that with uh, the two territories uh, in uh, Ukraine. Um, I apologize, Do Dobonos? Donbass. Donbass and uh, Crimea that, uh, that the West has effectively and Ukraine has effectively allowed Russia to take. And I think that's a, an, an analogy. I think the, uh, the rhetoric from Russia in regards to greater Russia or Russian speaking and, uh, and white Russians are very similar to the rhetoric we heard from uh, the Germans, Hitler, in regards to uh, Czechoslovakia, Austria, and East Prussia uh, and the German speakers, and even the rhetoric associated with uh, attacks on Germans in Poland versus uh, the current rhetoric of Putin in regards to attacks on, on Russian, uh, that both were, were just pub publicity PR uh, stunts, uh, rationales for attacks. Um, the massing of troops, the, the tank um, uh, um, war games, uh, you know, there's just so many um, analogies that are very similar. I think in uh, the summer of 1939, uh, as some of the fears of, uh, of war in Poland uh, grew, uh, France and Britain um, made empty promises to Poland um, that, that Hitler knew would not be met. Um, and, uh, and so therefore, I don't think we can make empty promises. We have to make sure that any promises, pledges we make are pledges that are, uh, are uh, backed up by reality, uh, actions that we really are willing to take. Um, and I think probably the smartest thing that FDR did uh, was Lend-Lease um, and was providing to Britain, to, uh, to Russia, to the USSR, huge amounts of, uh, of, uh, of armaments such that uh, the, the, uh, the Brits and, uh, and, and more importantly, the, the Russians, uh, the Soviet Union uh, could carry on the fight against Hitler for such a long time. Um, and, uh, and so I think that the comment that you made about that this has brought Ukrainians together and that Ukrainians are willing to and will fight for their own territorial integrity is key. And I think therefore what we need to do is we need to ensure that they are well-armed, well-equipped, well-trained, um, albeit with conventional warfare, nothing nuclear, such that, um, such that Russia knows that, Putin knows that, that there's gonna be body bags coming back to Moscow if he crosses that border. Um, and I hope to God that that doesn't happen, but I think you're right. You gotta stand up to bullies. And if we don't, then we're appeasers. And why would it stop at Ukraine? It's going to go Ukraine. It's going to go Belarus. It's going to go Kazakhstan. It's going to go Georgia. Or frankly, maybe it already has. Um, and then why would he stop there? Why wouldn't he go into the Baltics and Poland? And so I think that we need to, we need to grow a backbone. Yeah. 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 Andy Samachek, thank you so much for joining us. Remind us the website again, please. Oh. Seed, C E E D, C E E D web dot C A. Thank you so much. It's going to be interesting. We'll all Great have to you. watch and, uh, and hope that nothing that you've said or I said comes true. Hopefully, it all just pitters out. Thanks for joining Great. us. That's our show for tonight. I'm on every Monday through Friday at 9 60 a.m. at 6 p.m., or you can stream me online at www.saga960m.ca. Good night, Andy. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us.